Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming together this early morning to mourn, rally, and hear from our local organizations and leadership about the murder in Georgia this Tuesday evening. Please bear with me. Um, I have not slept much in the past few days. I'm still feeling very angry. I'm very devastated. I'm very tired, um, like many of others uh, this week and many of the folks are on the call today. My name is Vivian Zhou. I am the National Field Director at the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum, NAPOF. We do work to build power with Asian American Pacific Islander women to enact structural change that gains us full agency over our lives, our families, and our communities. As many of us know, there was a shooting in Georgia this Tuesday evening that targeted three massage parlors. Six of the eight victims in Georgia are Asian American women, and four of the six victims are Korean American women. As the stories are coming out from the families, we're learning more about the ambitions and dreams that they had, um, who they cared for and whom they loved. We are here to name that white supremacy, anti-Asian racism and sexism are at the root of these killings as well as the spike in harassment and violence against Asian Americans. New polling from NAPOF that was done in February and March has actually revealed that nearly half of Asian American and Pacific Islander women respondents who have been, have been affected by anti-Asian racism in the past two years. We can't ignore that the rise in anti-Asian harassment and violence has disproportionately impacted women. We, and we know firsthand that sexual violence, sexism and racism are intertwined. We are here together today to call our local elected officials to have a response to centers Asian American women and elders who have been disproportionately impacted and call for a response that results in true community support we have heard Mayor Lori Lightfoot's statement about increasing police presence in our neighborhoods, and we want to make it very clear, we do not need more law enforcement. Time and time again, more law enforcement has not led to protection and safety. I'm incredibly honored to be joined here today with powerful, phenomenal Asian American women leaders in Chicago from local organizations like mine that center AAPI women in their work. Many of our leaders today have been working tireless, tirelessly on these issues of the intersections within race, class, and gender within Asian American Pacific Islander communities. Today we have here Jihei Kim, Executive Director at Conwin, Inhei Choi, Executive Director at Hana Center, Neha Gill, Executive Director at Apnagar. However, she has lost her voice, so in her place, Radhika Sharma is here, Manager of Education and Outreach at Apnagar. Julia Ting, NAPOF Chicago chapter leader and member, and Nadia Mohajir, executive director at Heart Women and Girls, and Sanyan Choi Moro, our executive director at NAPOF. You will hear from us on how the murder on Tuesday night has impacted us as Asian American women doing this work, the connections that need to be made in this moment, and what are the solutions that we are asking for as Asian American women. So first, I will hand it off to Jihei Kim, the executive director at Conwin. Thank you. My name is Jihei Kim, pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm the executive director of Kanwen. For over 30 years, Kanwen has been working to eradicate gender-based violence in the Asian American and immigrant communities. The senseless killing of eight individuals, six of whom were Asian women, broke our hearts. Many of us at Kanwen are reminded of our survivors we serve, as well as friends and family members. individuals with their own unique stories, doing what they can to make a living and lead their lives. I hope everyone in our community is taking care of themselves and connecting um, so that we can support each other. This incident of racism and sexism playing out, it was uh, an incident of racism and sexism playing out at their deadliest form, but it was not an aberration. It resonates so much in us because we've seen and experienced the direct impact of racism and sexism in our lives and those of our survivors. As Asian women, we are subject to hypersexualization and must deal with street harassment with racial slurs so often, it doesn't even surprise us when it happens. Our survivors often stereotyped as meek and submissive, their voices get ignored and not listened to by the law enforcement or by governmental or even service organizations. Lack of language access and other systemic ba barriers can force Asian women into low wage jobs that further expose them to harassment and assault. And we must acknowledge that even within our community, 
sexism, domestic violence, and sexual assault are rampant. Not acknowledging the intersection of racism and sexism will only lead to further violence against Asian women and women of color. The law enforcement involved in this case is still saying that killings are not racially motivated, that the suspect was just having a bad day, and he wanted to get rid of temptation to treat a sex addiction. All these rhetoric minimizes the devastating gravity of the situation, the loss of eight innocent lives. Victims were clearly objectified and dehumanized, the very indication of racism and sexism. But again, we're not surprised. Our survivors face minimization and victim blaming all the time from so many places, including the law enforcement and even some in my community. Our survivors are told that assault you experience, that's not a big deal. All families are like that. Or they hear, what did you do to provoke him? Or why were you there in the first place? By minimizing, we turn our attention away from the violence, allowing it to happen again and again. Women and girls become the forgotten victims. It is no surprise that one in four women in this country are experiencing domestic violence. One in six American women has been a victim of attempted or completed rape, and one in nine girls experience sexual abuse. Within the API immigrant community, the rate of gender-based violence is even higher because of the increased vulnerability due to their race, immigration status, and other cultural and linguistic barriers. So we urge our leaders and community members to face these facts head on and acknowledge the reality of what's going on. Failing to acknowledge racialized misogyny will only work to further jeopardize the safety and well-being of women and girls and increase incidents of hate crimes against immigrants and people of color. Merely jumping into actions like increasing policing is failing to listen to our survivors' needs and failing to foster community-based solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jihei. Next, who's going to be speaking is Inhei Choi from HANA Center, the executive director at HANA Center. Good morning. Um, my name is Inhei Choi, and I'm with the HANA Center. Um, thank you so much, Jihei. That was really uh, important for us to really remember all the, all the, every word, every lesson that you have um, shared. Thank you. Um, HANA Center is an immigrant justice organization that provides critical services and builds power of Korean, Asian American, and multi-ethnic immigrant uh, communities in the Chicago area. Our hearts go out with all the families and friends, uh, the impacted ones in communities across the country, also impacted by the mass killing in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we know that that the news of this atrocity uh, is particularly hurting our Asian American community that has already been struggling to protect ourselves and the loved ones from the spread of COVID-19 that all, also actually happened at the same time as the rampant Asian American violence was rising um, and the racism and the anti-immigrant policies that we've been living with in the last four years and more, but particularly in the last four years. Um, so HANA Center condemns the anti-Asian hate, gender vice-based violence, and white supremacy that, leads, that led to this violent loss of life in Atlanta. As uh, Asian Americans and Asian American women, uh, this targeted violence that resulted in killing of six Asian American women was especially hard because it accentuates the culture of sexualizing Asians. This is a, there's a long history of festicizing Asian American women uh, or Asian women as disposable that have led white men to exploit, traffic, rape, and murder Asian women without accountability here in the US, but also in Asian countries where sex industry around the US base, military bases proliferated all over. For Asian American women, we're also aware that imperialism, militarism, and corporate greed dehumanize, displace, and target all of us. So there needs to be an accountability with a clear understanding that this is racism, gender-based violence, and misogyny that are underlying causes of the violence committed. We also know that this mass shooting is also a part of a larger story of marginalized communities terrorized by anti-Black racism and xenophobia, including 
ongoing police murder of Black, Latinx, and LGBTQ plus people, and deportation of immigrants. There are 11 million undocumented immigrants, including 1.7 million Asian Americans who are forced to live in the shadows. Thousands of intercountry adoptees, over half of which are Asian heritage, are also deport deported um, and, and becoming undocumented because of uh, being adopted, even though they're being adopted by the US citizens. So this is a state violence as well, but in the form of deportation and refusal to recognize one's belonging to a country. So Congress must also legislate a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented immigrants and detention and end detention and deportation. So in order to heal, rebuild, we must have our local, state, and federal governments to invest in sustained programming for physical and mental health, legal em employment, and immigration services to immigrants, women, and communities of color. Thank you. Thank you so much, and hey, those are really important points. I want to also pass it to Radhika Sharma, who is at Apnagar. Thank you, and thank you to my sisters who've spoken before me. Apnagar <clears throat> stands in solidarity with all of our partners here this morning. We are heartbroken by the killings of Asian American women and others at, in Atlanta on Tuesday evening. We mourn with the families, friends, and communities of the victims, and we stand in solidarity with our communities against racism, casteism, anti-immigrant bias, devaluation of women, girls, and gender minorities, and gender-based violence. At Upnagar, we deeply understand the impact of violence, devaluing, dehumanizing and misrepresenting Asian American, Pacific Islander, Muslim, Black, Indigenous, Latinx, trans, Dalit, and other marginalized people create an environment where violence and discrimination are normalized. We call for gun reform, an end to racism, misogyny, unchecked male privilege, hatred, intolerance, so that our society can be free of violence, trauma, and oppression. Instead, let us come together to create a safer, more just world in which future generations can thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Radhika. It's really important for us to come together right now. I'm going to now pass it to Julia Ting, our Chicago chapter member and leader. My name is Julia Ting. Pronouns are she, hers. I'm a Chicago chapter leader with NAPOF, the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. I am first generation Chinese American. When I found out about the Atlanta shooting, I was sitting in my bed on my phone when a news notification popped up. I scrolled through it, reading that six of the eight people killed were Asian women, even as the article insisted that it was unclear if the attack was racially motivated. I searched for more articles wanting to know if any news outlet would name the shooting for the racist, misogynistic, classist violence it was. As I kept looking and found none, I felt pressure building in my chest. I tried to take deep breaths to calm myself down, but the pressure just kept building and building. It took me a bit to realize that my hands were shaking and that I was crying. The best way I know to describe those feelings is by saying that my heart hurt. It hurt then and it hurts now. My heart hurt for these women who were just trying to make a living when they were killed at their workplace. My heart hurts for Asian women across the country and especially for those working in the service industries. My heart hurts for my elders who cannot go grocery shopping without putting themselves at risk of violence. I'm scared for them all and I'm scared for myself. The ideas that fueled the Atlanta shooting are not new. I think of all of the times I've been catcalled with a racial slur. All of the times I've been reduced down to stereotypes of docility and submissiveness, and all of the times that I've been seen not as a person, but as an exotic sexual object. After hearing about the attack, I had the thought that I did not want to exist inside my body. I wish that I could trade my face out for another, 
or one that makes me less of a target for the sexualization that too often results in violence. But I am not what is wrong, and it is not Asian women who are wrong. It is not us who need to change. In response to the attack, Mayor Lightfoot has called for increased police presence in Chicago areas with large AAPI populations. This prospect is honestly terrifying. When I see a police officer on the street, my body's first reaction is to tense up. I often hold my breath as I walk past them, relaxing only when there's enough distance between us. The spokesperson of the Cherokee County Sheriff's Office in Georgia proudly took a picture of his anti-Asian shirt almost a year ago, but still maintains the power that comes with his position and used it to talk about the shooter having a bad day. I cannot trust that the police serve people of color, immigrants, nor women, and ask Mayor Lightfoot to truly listen to the Asian community in Chicago and hear us when we say that more policing does not make us safer. I call on our legislators to do more than just condemn Tuesday's massacre. Words alone are empty and will not solve this. We need real actions and policy changes that will actually improve our safety, especially the safety of those experiencing the most harm, women and elders. This looks like true aid to our families, community support, government support, and an emphasis on our lived experiences so that relief flows to those who need it most. Decriminalize our existence and survival as immigrants, workers, and women in this country. Our community has come together in incredible ways, but we can support each other only so much. Our governments and laws must support us as well. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, for your words. I'm going to pass it now to Nadia Mohajer, Executive Director, Heart Women and Girls. Good morning. I want to begin by expressing my gratitude to my sisters at this rally all, and all of your leadership in providing healing and community after this terrible tragedy. My name is Nadia Mohajer, and I am Executive Director of Heart. The national, a national nonprofit working to promote reproductive justice and sexual violence prevention in Muslim communities. We are devastated and enraged to hear about the horrifying murders of, of six Asian American women in massage parlors in Atlanta by a white supremacist, supremacist earlier this week. Our team shares the grief of the families whose loved ones were taken so senselessly. We call for a culture of community care check in on your Asian neighbors, friends, and family, and find ways to be in community. Muslim communities are the most diverse religious minority in North America. South Asian, Southeast Asian, and East Asian people are key members of our Muslim spaces. We are store owners and teachers, lawyers and entrepreneurs. We occupy the restaurant and hotel industries, the healthcare industry, the beauty and massage industries, and many others. As a predominantly South Asian Muslim woman of color led team, we know that these attacks do not happen in a vacuum and are just one example of a long standing history of anti Asian sentiment in this country. Rather, they are a function of systemic and structural violence stemming from a history of fetishization and sexualization of Muslim a Asian women, xenophobia, and white supremacy. Asian women who identify as Muslim also stand at the intersection of gendered Islamophobia, the ways in which the state utilizes gendered forms of violence to oppress, monitor, punish, maim, and control Muslim bodies. Yet in order to address this violence, we cannot use this as an opportunity to increase policing in our communities under the guise of protect protecting us from white supremacist violence. Historically, we know that increased policing has led to the surveillance of our communities through counterterrorism and policing programs like CBE, which further perpetuate gendered stereotyping of Muslims, Asians, and other marginalized communities. Rather, we call for a stop to this continuous cycle of anti-Asian racism by a call for meaningful accountability and investing in community-led solutions that center the well-being of Asian communities so that ultimately we all can thrive in the places that we work, live, and pray. Anti-Asian racism and violence has disproportionately impacted Asian women, especially during this pandemic. From economic injustice to increased violence in their homes and increased hate crimes to separations of families at the border, 
we must collectively work to invest in the safety of Asian women and their well being. We need solutions that improve meaningful health and mental health care access, offer culturally informed support and services, and center economic justice. Make no mistake, these attacks will not stop. As long as the fetishization and dehumanization of Asian women continues, our lives, our labor, class, and immigration status will continue to be invisible. This country has a legacy of white supremacy. What will it take to recognize and finally address it? We call upon our representatives to address anti-Asian violence by dismantling white supremacy and misogyny and investing in our community's safety and well-being through community-led solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia, and thank you for making those important connections across communities. I'm now going to pass it to Sanyan Choi Moro, our Executive Director at NAPOF, um, to close us out. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And I especially want to thank uh, my fellow uh, colleagues in this work. Um, as you've heard from all of them, um, that you know, this is this has been a really devastating time for our community and just want to hear, you know, want to make sure we underscore that, um, you know, this was something we feared, you know, it, it, it should have never happened, but we are not surprised that it happened. And so, um, you know, I'm thankful for their leadership and the work that they do in this in this space. And, you know, I just want to wrap wrap up um, our statement by saying that, you know, um, this is not just something that's that's happened in Atlanta that you know is happening now. It's been you know throughout history in the United States and the way um, we have uh, it, it treated Asian American and Asian women um, is the reason why the, the tragic shootings have happened and why so many of us feel this so deeply and so personally. Uh, we cannot forget that it is you know starting from the history of. 1875 with Page Act, where East Asian women were, you know, assumed to be all prostitutes and therefore banned from this country, um, all the way through the different wars that the United States fought, uh, militarizing and colonizing various Asia Pacific regions um, that we are here today, and that you know, it, with the with the military presence in our home countries, like my home country in Korea, and in you know, in, in Okinawa, and in um, the Philippines that the you know state sanctioned and state um, run um, you know military areas and the the presence of um, the demand for uh, commodification of Asian Asian women bodies is is something that we have to reckon with. We cannot talk about this incident as if it just is an isolated incident that happened in Atlanta. Um, it is. It is. It happened because of the history of how Asian women are racialized and um, and se sexualized, you know, in this country as, as well as countries of our origin. And so, I don't want it to be lost on us that um, this is not, you know, I, I that that there is an arc of history and narrative that's political and historical that we need to take into consideration. Um, and that all of us here on this call have had family members or have history or, or have experienced um, the, the direct insults and violence that's been thrown at us because of the hypersexualization of Asian American women. Um, so we will open up for Q&A. Um, so if you have a question, you can um, put it in the Q&A box and we can uh, moderate and and feel that. So if, you, if there's a specific uh, panelist you would like to ask a question to, um, please do that. Um, otherwise, we will moderate the Q&A section. Um, and while, while we wait for questions, is there anything else the panelists would like to add? Um, Yes, um, Sonyeon, we also want to call attention to the fact that across the country, thousands of advocates for immigrant and refugee survivors of gender-based violence attest to the diminished and uh, lesser response when the authorities do respond to intimate partner violence, especially when uh, the survivors do not speak English or do not speak a language spoken by the responding authorities. 
uh, survivors of gender-based violence who do not speak English are less likely to uh, have a police report completed uh, to have the responding police provide the badge number, provide the report number, and to provide options to the survivors. We know that amongst all of these other issues, the issue of language access means that non-English speaking survivors of violence, uh, justice is delayed and denied to them. They are not receiving equal response from our society, uh, which is in direct violation of the US Civil Rights Act and Title VI of that act. So we also call attention to the fact that we must ensure that language is not a barrier to justice and to equal access to services for survivors of abuse. Thank you for that, uh, Radhika. Um, I, there, were, there are a few questions here. One is about an in-person gathering. Um, Vivian, if you could speak to that and then I can feel some of the other reporter questions that's just come in. Yeah, I know that um, our local Napa Chicago chapter is working on uh, a vigil right now, but there are events this weekend as well um, that I know in Hay uh, could also speak to. Yeah, thank you. Um, so there are, uh, I know that there are several vigils uh, or events. Um, one that HANA Center is working uh, with is a cross-community interfaith uh, community gathering and an interfaith uh, prayer vigil with the United Congress of Community and Religious Organizations that brings together uh, immigrants, um, uh, Black and Latinx community organizations and faith leaders. Um, so there will be um, uh, a vigil tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning, and it will be uh, it will be a online event. So we will put out the registration and information on the chat uh, for your information, or it would also can be sent out um, as post uh, you know post material. Um, there's a question. There are actually a couple of questions here about. Um, what it what it looks like for to have you know alternative solutions to um, law enforcement or increasing police. Um, I can start, and then I'd like to you know invite other panelists if they want to chime in. Um, you know, I, I I think the crux of the issue with that solution to me is that it's a band aid to a very systemic and deeply rooted problem. Right? It's a whack a mole approach to addressing something that is beyond what police can do. And so the question is, do I, as an Asian American, feel safer? Asian American women, do I feel safer that we have more police presence in our community? And the answer is no, I don't feel safer because frankly, the way that uh, the law enforcement personnel in Atlanta have handled this situation and the things they have said and the anti-Asian sentiments they have presented in public does not make me feel any safer around police officers. And so I think we need to make sure that that narrative is clear and that I want elected officials and our government to not just do these short one-off solutions that they can say, oh, look, I did something, right? That is my, my fundamentally the problem with this approach is that all these mayors across the country are saying we're increasing surveillance and law enforcement in Asian American communities, and I'm, you know, that's, that's not the right solution. That's not enough. That's not okay. Because what that happens is who, then who are you, who are you criminalizing? Who are you going after in, in, in that, you know, so one, we need to rethink how we do public safety, right? At minimum, we need to really train and, you know, I mean, white supremacy and racism within police forces is nothing new, right? And I want to echo that, that we are calling for reform. We're calling for changes, that there is better community and culturally informed public safety that takes place. And, you know, and I think all of us have different ideas of how that could happen and happy to talk to the mayor, happy to talk to, you know, folks who are in charge for, for more discussions on how we do that. But we need to invest more resources in, in our community and in government uh, agencies 
so that they are relating to our community in language and culturally appropriate, right? We, we, through people that our community members trust, right? And to um, Esther's point about why are we reluctant to report? Because we don't think we're gonna be heard or taken seriously, right? And so again, I think the answer here is that we want genuine, long-term, consistent, frequent communication and partnership we don't want just a one-off solution where you just deploy more police officers into our community. Um, anybody else want to speak to this? Um, I can go. I mean, you've seen all of us nodding our heads. I 100% agree. Couldn't agree anymore. Um, and you know, just speaking from our experience, I lived experience of working with survivors uh, of gender-based violence. Law enforcement is just one part maybe like 1% of all of the safety solutions that we're working with. It's not just that we as victim service survivors advocacy organizations, we're always calling the police and you know, filing for order of protection. Maybe we do that, but that is like vast minority. And I'm sure our sisters at Nagar will agree. Many of our clients who are Asian um, immigrants and people of color, they're afraid to contact law enforcement. We've faced so much systemic barriers and even with language barrier where law enforcement and systems don't listen to us or even refuse to lose, use language access, they have all these resources, um, that is not the solution. And with immigration as well, it's, it might trigger all these different consequences for our families if you were to exercise that law enforcement option. So we have to think broadly and holistically and many of our clients and survivors they need stuff like counseling, case management, holistic way of looking at their issues. And yeah, it needs to be broader and holistic, not just one off solution. Absolutely. Thank you, Jihei. Um, very uh, practically, um, until the 24th, next Wednesday, the Chicago Police Department is receiving public comment on their revisions to the search warrant policy. And so we encourage the public to look at uh, their proposed changes and any other changes, uh, policy changes by any law enforcement body to ensure that they are true meaningful change and not defensive um, uh, uh, policies that are there to, and practices that are there more to defend uh, um, police and other law enforcement when they are held accountable uh, for their violations of, of, of language access and other civil rights of the people whom, um, whom they're responding to in situations of uh, violence and other crimes. Also, uh, people who have looked at this issue have found that there is a greater engagement of immigrant survivors of crime when they are engaged and help to be part of the community and recognize any public services as being services which respect and engage them. Otherwise, if they are not reached out to, are not at the table when any kind of public services, uh, protocols and access are being planned, they are less likely, we are less likely to reach out and to believe in the legitimacy and to trust public institutions unless we know that they are truly respecting us and wanting to hear from us. Thank you. Um, there's a question here about how can, uh, what are action items individuals or other organizations, organizations can do to support? Um, again, I, 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 I can start addressing it and then I would love for other folks to chime in. Um, you know, what, I think one of the things that we, very simple thing that we can do in, as individuals, especially if you're an ally to our community, is that we need to really call out the normalization of um, sexualization of Asian American women in the media and in, in entertainment, right? Everything from the way people do makeup to make their eyes look more Asian um, to the way, um, you know, people, you know, the, the kinds of costumes you see at Halloween that are completely, um, you know, 
inappropriate in terms of culturally um, inappropriate use of our heritage and sexualizing that um, to just everyday conversations about jokes people crack and what what people's stereotypes are of Asian Americans. And it's not enough that you don't participate. You need to speak up. You know, misogyny does not end because everyone is silent about it. It ends because we all try to stop it together. And so that is that is something you can do at the individual level. In terms of organizations, you have heard from folks who are um, <laughs> part of really amazing critical work here in Chicago, um, supporting um, con- some of the most vulnerable community members. Um, please support them. Reach out to Apnagar, reach out to Kanlin, reach out to uh, Hana Center to Heart Women and Girls. If, if, you need, uh, if you need more contact information, feel free to reach out to the contact on our, our press release or to NAPOF and we're happy to put you in touch. We also have a chapter here in Chicago that that's um, you know, currently um, you know, working on various campaigns to change local and state laws to really reflect the needs of Asian American women and communities. And so get involved, pay attention um, um, to what we're, you know, what, what we're calling for, right? We don't, we just don't need one-off solutions. We need our policies to be intersectional. And so that's what we want to engage. And so, you know, if there are, if, if you're looking to support organizations that are trying to change policies on this, send that money to women, women of color led organizations because we're doing this intersectionally. This is not just a racial justice issue. This is not just an immigrant issue. This is not just a sexual violence issue. It's all of those things at the same time. So we appreciate um, amplifying that messaging. Um, and um, yeah, so I, I wanna create space for other folks if there's specific asks um, that people can get involved in. Um, I'd like to chime in. Thank you so much, Sung Young, um, for for starting that conversation and really, you know, um, talking about solutions that address the root causes um, and this like need for a really um, big culture shift in the ways that we think about dismantling gender based violence against all of our communities. Um, And I want to say another way um, when we're talking about taking an intersectional lens, I think economic justice uh, for Asian women is really important and thinking about what it looks like to fight for pay equity, to um, invest in the leadership of Asian women in a way that's not tokenizing, but in a way that is authentic. Um, And part of that. Um, It was brought up earlier in, in, um, I think, Jihei's uh, statement about that requires like believing us, believing us for our our experiences and believing us for um, the expertise and and trusting us to bring that expertise to the table. And I think oftentimes, um, again, you know, our our um, communities work to, uh, you know, uh, promote DEI efforts, but in a way that is just kind of thinking about um, how to do it performatively and just check off boxes rather than thinking about what, how do we actually serve the full uh, Asian woman that's working for us in this space. And that requires thinking about from everything from how are we paying her to what are her unique needs um, as an Asian woman um, that may be different from you know other um, employees that we have. I, I just wanna also add that to everything that's already been said and so critical that something as just, it, it could feel simple but to really make sure that we name what's going on, that we understand what is all happening around us. As we said to to Asian women, Asians, people of color, immigrants, undocumented people, to other so many marginalized people, that there is a real force that's really connecting all of these all of these incidences. Um, you know, again, like locally, globally, everything. So there is a real thing called you know misogyny. Uh, gender-based violence, sexism, racism, white supremacy, so many ways, right? And also like, we gotta also remember about militarism. We gotta remember imperialism. Though these are all the forces that you know displace people. And really that's why we're all here too uh, in the United States. So I just think that it's really, it's really important to name it and to know it and to call it out and, um, and to speak up and to protect ourselves and those around us. Thank you. Um, there's one question here um, about 
how can, what can we learn from each other uh, between different Asian American and Pacific Islander groups that have survived violence, uh, violence um, at different points, for example, the Chinese Exclusion Act and post 9-11 attacks. Um, does anybody wanna kick us off on, on that one? We can learn from uh, the works of people who have organized in Asian American communities. Um, DRUM, an organization in New York City, has done historically incredible work in um, coalescing the voices of uh, South Asians and Muslims who were targeted after 9-11. They have done incredibly beautiful human work of um, making a space to um, bring together mothers who have um, lost, who, whose children were killed uh, while trying to cross the border and bringing them together with mothers whose sons have been in, in immigration detention. So South Asian and Latinx people coming together and recognizing the shared struggle and the shared injustices that they have experienced also when right-wing elements um, within immigrant communities have tried to suppress the movement to hold um, all responding officers, including Asian American officers who have committed violence um, uh, while on the job as officers. The uh, right-wing elements have tried to suppress our uh, their actions and so groups like DRUM said, okay, if you need to close your offices because your family's addresses have been publicized by these, uh, by these uh, right-wing groups, then you know, come and use our offices. We are, there are practical ways that we can step up and support all of us who are trying to ensure that not only that we are treated uh, equally, but that we equally hold one another accountable when any members of our community participate in state sanctioned violence. Anybody else wanna chime in? I can also chime in. Um, I think definitely increased dialogue in API groups to learn about each other's experience is incredibly important. What we know, um, you might not know, and what you know, I might not know, or our advocates might not know. And especially when it comes to gender issues, we, we uh, face um, hesitancy in many API communities to accept that gender-based violence is going on. No matter mm -hmm. how prevalent it is, there is hesitancy, there is, um, you know, refusal to believe that violence against women and children exists in our own communities. So we have to open that up and we have to acknowledge it and we have to name it and we have to deal with it. And um, if we can also have dialogue with other, um, other communities of color. I mean, when you look at black and brown communities, Muslim communities, indigenous communities, women bear the brunt of discrimination, harassment and hatred, and their experiences get erased all the time by the media and the community. And we have to acknowledge that. Yeah, thank you, Gia, for that. In fact, um, I joined a little late on, on this conference call because I was um, um, hosted um, uh, I was on a, uh, the Rainbow Pushes ra radio show and, you know, being on a panel with black women was really powerful. And, you know, um, I actually started crying because they kept saying, we see you, we see you. And we, um, we know what you're going through. And I, I, you know, this is even beyond just the API community coming together, you know, um, and you know, you know, and and we we were you know being fictitious about how all women of color have this magical sexual power, right? That like the way we are portrayed in media, the way we're portrayed, you know, just you know, everyday understanding of who we are as Black women, Latinas, Asian American women, um, that this is a big problem. And so I think it is also about you know the conversations that that we have and um, the space that we share with, with, with um, other communities who have been experiencing this. And, and to me, I think a, bi a big part of the learning is that we cannot, and I cannot emphasize this enough, we as Asian Americans cannot 
look for safety and security at the expense of black and brown lives. And this is why we cannot call for law enforcement because we will not, we will not stand for white supremacy uh, dividing us and telling us that if you wanna be safe, then black people have to die. We will not accept that. And so I just wanna be really clear that you know, the, the work we have to do to, together is much more complex because we don't want simple solutions. Um, and uh, so, so just want, you know, want to really underscore that for our community. Um, another question is how can we hold state accountable to these injustices? Anybody want to take that? Go ahead, sure. Go ahead. Amongst other things, um, you know, here in Chicago with the mayor's office on uh, new Americans, uh, other such bodies uh, record any time that you hear of a publicly funded organization not providing full access, uh, you know, through interpretation or translation for a person who does not speak English, who's trying to access their services. We need to count all of these times that uh, services are denied because of uh, issues of language access. We need to count every single time uh, a responding officer or any other city employee is disrespecting and dehumanizing a survivor of crime or dismissing their complaints as being less than or less important than any others. Those are some of the ways in which we can hold people accountable is to begin to count, to collect the data. Uh, please know that there are coalitions such as the Illinois Language Justice Coalition convened by Asian Americans Advancing Justice Chicago. And those uh, coalitions such as that are working together to try and make sure that any publicly funded institution, which is bound by law to provide reasonable access, uh, language access, to hold them accountable when they aren't. Uh, we need to make sure that we are documenting all of these cases. That's just one of the many ways that we can do this. And we also can look to um, the wonderful work in the bystander intervention uh, model that uh, was uh, based in uh, the African-American women's response to street harassment, the Hollaback um, uh, response, which then helped to inform um, the uh, Asian-Americans advancing justice, developing uh, bystander intervention trainings to respond to anti-Asian uh, hate crimes. So standing up and publicly um, supporting people who are at risk of or who are experiencing uh, any type of discrimination is another way that we can uh, step forward and address whether it's another person on the street who is committing the abuse or whether it is uh, any kind of um, state funded body. Um. I, I'd like to add to that. Um, also, thank you, Radhika, um, for you know uh, demanding that we count all of the ways that um, we are you know disserviced um, by public officials. I think another thing um, that's important is you know thinking about how uh, public officials, law enforcement, you know uh, people who are supposed to protect us uh, respond to these tragedies in a way that is um, not just dismissive but just plain offensive um, in the ways that they talk about, um, you know, uh, in particular in th this case with Atlanta, how they spoke about um, the, um, the killer having a bad day. Um, and just, that is just another way that this kind of violence is minimized and um, erased um, and demanding uh, that our law enforcement do better and demanding apologies. Uh, it, it may seem performative, but it's very important for law enforcement to demonstrate that kind of accountability in order for any trust building to occur. Um, otherwise, um, they will continue to marginalize um, our communities. Um, thank you. Uh, I also want to just add that uh, with, you know, the government, all the different programs and ways that, you know, you could report all that, I think 
it's really important to also point out that as a community that's working with, uh, you know, women, uh, survivors, people of color, um, you know, people with uh, language needing at languages, you know, language barriers, and then, um, you know, immigrants, undocumented immigrants, many of them uh, really do not go to the government or here's a reporting or, you know, using that type, type of route as much as they do to really coming into the organizations like ours. They come to the trusted organizations. They trusted their own, you know, network. Uh, you know, they could go to the, 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 the faith institutions and faith leaders. Um, and so it's really important that the government recognizes that. And so the, the government's role also is to support organizations like ours and, and people of color, women led organizations also with programming. So, you know, we've been, you know, really with the, with the leadership of the movement for black lives, we've been, we've all been on board with, you know, uh, the movement to defund police. And that really is about no more funding to law enforcement, no more funding to, or any growing. Every time there's some incident, it's like the governments from local to the federal just ramp up more on the, on the you know, um, law, uh, military, military to the police response. And we are saying that use that money for the programming that our communities are needing. As we've been saying, physical, mental health, you know, all the various support uh, services that, that our community needs. So that's another way of being accountable um, that seemingly feels much more rhetorical and all that, but it's not. They have the power, the government has the power to move the money where it belongs. And our community needs that, uh, not more police. That has to be, that's another way to name all this. I think we have to all learn to say what it is that we are wanting. And I also want to recognize as immigrant community organization, community in particular, a lot of this language, a lot of these concepts do not always get to the community base. So it's our uh, job to make sure that there is that awareness, there is that language that people can say, because I think people know it. It's a common sense at the, you know, when you think about it at the core, but you know, how do we talk about it? What does that mean? You know, I think everyone feels it. So it's in all of us uh, are to be accountable to make sure that that can happen. All right, thank you so much. Thanks everyone, um, especially to Gia, Nadia, Radhika, um, Inhe, and Neha, I see that you're on the call as well um, for coming together on such short notice. and. Uh, more importantly, for the work that you do every single day, whether we are in the news headlines or not. And, you know, I can't emphasize enough how um, I am so angry that the reason we get to talk about our stories and our community is because eight people died and six from our community died. Um, that's unacceptable. And I hope that we find a way to shift the narrative and how we have conversations about immigrant community, especially women of color in this country uh, for good moving forward. Um, and so thank you everybody for coming today to this call. Um, again, the websites of all of our organizations have been just put in the chat box. So reach out to us for follow-up comments or further uh, conversations. Um, and again, you can also just reach out to NAPHOF uh, communications team and we can help you find the right people if you're not able to get a hold of anybody on this call. So thank you for coming today.